happy Friday, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning, and looking very dapper, if I don't say so myself, is Mr. Mark Ellis. Welcome, one and all, to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. Thank you, Sinead, live from our studios here in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> On today's show, we're going to be talking new mutants, old rappers, and if you wear a bag over your head, it's time to start killing people again. I'm merely Mark Ellis, but Sinead, you know, you and I have done a lot of shows together. We've seen a lot of panels. This one is certainly one of them, huh? Absolutely, Mark. Joining us this morning is Perry Nemiroff. Sadly, I didn't get the dapper menu to... Menu. <laughs> I'm hungry. I look like I should be serving you a menu right now. I, I'm starving. And the reason that I, I have this on today is because I've been up since 5 in the morning. So breakfast happened at 5, so I'm hungry. So memos are menus right now. Can Ooh, I have one, please? 5 in the morning. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, I know. Also here, even though he is being announced third, he is number one in my heart, Aww. David Griffin. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, I'll, I'll take it. Thank you, Sinead. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> you literally. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Griffin is the coolest. He took that compliment like he just tapped in for par. Thank you. Moving on. <laughs> Rude. Very <laughs> excited about Movie Talk today. We have a lot of cool stories. We're also going to be getting some live tweets from you guys at the end of the show. Sinead, which story is kicking us off first? Is it the Spurs beating the Rockets last night? No, Mark. Actually, oh. it is about <laughs> New Mutants. So THR is reporting that Split and the witches Anya Taylor-Joy and Game of Thrones' Ma Maisie Williams have signed on to star in Josh Boone's X-Men spinoff, New Mutants. The movie is headed towards an early July start with a script by Boone and his writing partner, Nate Gwaltney. The movie will focus on the adventures of a group of mutant teens that include Danielle Moonstar, Wolfsbane, Sunspot, Cannonball, and Magic, along with an alien named Warlock. Taylor-Joy will play Magic, a girl who has learned sorcery and uses teleportation discs to travel, while Williams will play Wolfsbane, a girl struggling to reconcile her religious beliefs as her powers of turning into a wolf develop. The movie is dated for an April 13th, 2018 release. Mark, your thoughts on the casting for New Mutants? Well, we're less than a year away from the movie, but apparently the marking material is already ready to go. Go ahead and throw that picture back oh, no. up there, Adam. <laughs> is Maisie Williams playing Wolfsbane as a troll doll? Look at that. Rub that thing's head for good luck. You know, in all seriousness, no, this is great casting news because Anya Taylor-Joy and Maisie Williams are two of the better actresses up and coming right now. Obviously, I enjoyed Anya Taylor-Joy in movies like The Witch, which I loved, and Split, which blew me away. And Macy Williams might be my favorite character right now on Game of Thrones. But this is better news for me, just hearing that New Mutants is actually getting a production start date. It's got a release date now. I think mm -hmm. April 13th is a good landing spot for a big universe, but a smaller property than not a lot of people are going to be aware of. Now, I myself had some New Mutants comics when I was a kid, but I'm not as familiar with the lore as a lot of other people. So if you want to get really sweaty about it, probably check out John Schnapp Show Heroes next week. In the meantime, though, David, this is some exciting casting news. It's very exciting. I think that was a big thing after Logan. Everybody's like, oh, where, where are they going to go next? Are we going to mm -hmm. go in the direction of a new mutants? Looks like we're actually going to get that, of course. Great casting choices by these two women. Fantastic actors. Anya Taylor Joy just has that presence. I mean, she's playing Magic, who's also Colossal's sister. You know, uh, Colossus' sister. So that's really exciting, too. And she's already played a witch, so she's had that kind of a role. And two, what's interesting is I'm trying to figure out, and I think a lot of us are curious about what universe this is going to take place in. I think for most of the viewing public, outside of our movie talk fans, of course, um, a lot of people don't really know, like, what universe of X-Men movies take place. And they're all in little different pockets. You know, Legion has its own pocket, its own universe. Uh, Days of Future Past has its own universe. Logan is in its own universe. So I'm going to be curious where this is going to line up, you know, in, in the X-Men slate. But I'm excited to see I think the casting's perfect for this. Yeah, and Perry, David brings up Logan, and in Logan, we saw a lot of people get excited, obviously, to see Hugh Jackman back as Wolverine, but also we got a teenage female who becomes this superhero. We're going to get more of that with New Mutants. I'm so excited to hear this. These two are, are really, I mean, you said it, they're some of the best young actresses coming up today, and Game of Thrones is a really exciting thing. I know Maisie Williams has been working on other films on the side, but I think they're, you know, lower-profile movies that aren't really getting out into the public, but even if you are someone who has just seen her work in Game of Thrones, it isn't really a thing where, oh, because Game of Thrones is so hot right now, there's a chance that she could only be, you know, Game of Thrones for the rest mm -hmm. of her career. I look at her work on that show, and you can tell that she has something a little more. It's a very natural on-screen presence, kind of like Anya Taylor-Joy has, where 
no matter what the two of them are in, I really do think we're going to get a certain level of work no matter what. But speaking to what you just brought up, David, I think there was some talk. I don't know if it's been confirmed. I lean towards no on this, that James McAvoy is going to be part of this movie. So I imagine it takes place within the same realm everything does. But hopefully we hear more about that soon. But also... Josh Boone, I'm just so excited to see him direct another movie. He did this one movie a while back. I think it was his first feature called Stuck in Love, which is an indie movie that nobody saw. But Not it's, the uh, Greg Kinnear, Matt Damon movie, Stuck with no, You, or Stuck no, on de You. No, definitely not that movie. This one's kind of cute. It stars Nat Wolf. So it's, mm -hmm. if you can seek that out, I think it's worth a watch if you just want to know what he can do beyond uh, Fault in Our Stars. That was the big one, right? That was the yeah, big one. Yeah, that was the big one. Fault in Our Stars is still pretty good, but this is on another level, and I am dying to see what he can bring to this franchise. Now, it'd be, it'd be, what they're going to have here, too, is they're going to have a... They're, they're doing a wide casting search right now. They're looking for someone to play Moonstar, who's gonna, who is Native American. They're looking for somebody South American to play Sunspot, I believe. So, David, they're going ethnically appropriate for all of these roles that they're casting here, but it seems like a new band that they're having together. Do you think we're going to see any of our X-Men favorites into this universe, or do you think they're going to separate it a little a little bit more. You know, I think it's going to be a little bit of both. I feel like with these big tent poles, you have to have a little bit of that old flavor in there, whether, like Perry was saying, it's going to be a James McAvoy. I mean, we're pretty sure Hugh Jackman's done, but we're going to have somebody, I think, maybe like a Fazbin or somebody's going to come in. I think you have to be like, oh, that's where those people are from. Like, they're part of that universe. Just kind of like, you know, we see with the Spider-Man trailers we've been seeing lately. It's always Robert Downey Jr. is always by Peter Parker's mm -hmm. side. And there's a reason for that. One, he's playing being a father figure, but two, he's also like, oh, he's part of that universe now. We're not seeing the Spider-Man with Andrew Garfield anymore. People, I think, need that reassurance. So I think we're going to see somebody. I think maybe James McAvoy might be that person. I also want to say real quick, I think it's awesome that two Game of Thrones stars now, yeah. Sophie Turner, of course, is Jean Grey already, right. mm -hmm. and now we have Macy Williams, so it's good to see that the young Game of Thrones stars are getting some work as well. Yeah, yeah. hopefully maybe one day they're in a movie together where they get more time on screen together than they do <laughs> yeah. in Game of Thrones. They're all going to be the back The Starks are coming day. back together. Those yeah. Starks, their family reunion is weird, but there's really good turkey legs. All right, Sinead, what's our next story? As we gear up for the release of Wonder Woman, fans of Diana Prince's big screen debut are now turning to early box office tracking, hoping that the first female-driven superhero movie movie is a box office hit. Both THR and Deadline are reporting a $65 million debut, with some industry experts saying it could likely climb to $75 million closer to its release. The rap is also saying a majority of independent trackers have it in the $65 million range, noting one outlying service projecting a whopping $105 million for its debut. We won't have to wait long to find out how it does in theaters when Wonder Woman debuts on June 2nd. Perry, what are your thoughts on the box office tracking, and how big do you think it will open? Okay, first off, for everyone freaking out, calm down. One, because of that silly headline that will not go away, and it's Wonder Woman is projected to be the lowest opener of the DCEU because, okay, maybe it's going to open with a little less. That doesn't mean it's not going to be a profitable movie. And also, chill out with the tracking. So the point of tracking is really to give the studio the heads up to know, you know, you're nearing the end of your marketing campaign. This is where you should direct your attention. This is how you should spend the money. Even, I believe it was either the deadline or the THR report, even said that even though, you know, these tracking services said 65 million right now. By the end of next week, that number could jump up to 75. So this is really just to give them a sense of how to spend their money until the movie comes out. I think it's going to come close to a, a pretty big number. I want to say something like 90 million. And I'll admit that might be wishful thinking just because I want Wonder Woman to be good. I want it to do well. I really want it to just, you know, change the momentum of the DCEU right now. And I think it has a shot of it because look at how well BVS and Suicide Squad did. There's serious interest in this, and also, this is a huge deal. It's one of the first female-led superhero movies, and I think that in and of itself is going to drive so many people, whether it's because they're a big fan of Wonder Woman to begin with, they're a big fan of the DCEU to begin with, or they're just curious to see where this can lead us going forward. That's right. I mean, look, to borrow a headline from the news stories this morning, I think that box office tracking is 100% accurate with a few exceptions. I think it's total crap. I, I think tracking means nothing in this day and age. Look at the tracking numbers we've seen recently for big movies, whether it was a couple years ago when you had Jurassic World go way past expectations or Furious 7, and then you come to this year with Beauty and the Beast when it was tracking around this same time before its release date, it was tracking at about $120 million. It ended up making $175 million. I do not buy into tracking at all. I think that the studio is actually correct in its assumption that this movie is going to make at least $100 
hundred million dollars opening weekend because Perry makes a great point. This is the superhero movie that a lot of people have been waiting their entire lives to see in the same way that a lot of little girls wanted to see Beauty and the Beast on the big screen because they've been waiting to see a live action Belle their entire lives. There is a lot of men and women that want to see Wonder Woman more so than they wanted to see Batman be Superman, which begs the question, is there a lack of marketing when you compare it to other DC movies? Mm -hmm. So not just what its box office take is going to be, but how much Warner Brothers is actually putting into this project. So David, I'll also ask you, mm -hmm. do you think that the tracking is accurate when they say $65, $70 million, or do you think it's going to be north of that? It's going to be north. They're, they're lowballing. All the studios do that because they want to be surprised. So when Monday comes around, they do their interviews. You're going to see on Variety, Hollywood Reporter, be like, oh, we, we, we had no idea. We had no idea there'd be this kind of reception for that. Of course they do. Of course they want it. I mean, we see Wonder Woman is everywhere. Mark, we're talking about sports. You know, you're watching the NBA Finals and things like that. You see, you know, the Wonder Woman advertisement trailer. I talked to my mom the other day. She's almost seven years old. She's excited about seeing Wonder Woman. You know, I think the, it's out there. People know it's coming. It's definitely going to do around, I think, 90 million to 100 million. But they got a low ball so they can act shocked when the numbers are higher than they thought they were going to be. Like, we never saw this coming. Isn't it funny how we all turn into marketing experts, So when somebody know, yeah, says, right. oh, this movie isn't being marketed enough or it's being overly marketed? We all live in our little bubble. And even though we cover movies on a daily basis here at Movie Talk, like David said, when I watch TV, I watch live sports or Family Guy. And it just so happens that on a lot of the NBA playoff games, they've been running Wonder Woman ads the last couple weeks. So in my little pea brain, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, this movie's everywhere. But when you go into Target or you go into Kmart, if you live in that part of the world, you walk in and you see, ah, there's a lot of Star Wars stuff here. There isn't as much Wonder Woman stuff as you would expect a few weeks before the movie opens. There's certainly not as much as there was when Batman v Superman came out. And there's not as much when an Avengers or a Captain America or Iron movie comes out. So it does lead one to think, wait, are they marketing this as much? What is the budget for this? It is dwarfed by what the marketing budget was for Batman v Superman. But that could have a number of different reasons. For one, Batman v Superman was coming out in March. And and so there's not a lot of other movies that Warner Brothers had to market around that time. But when you look at the slate that Warner Brothers has coming out this summer, there's a ton of movies, including Everything, Everything, The House, Dunkirk, Annabelle, Creation. It is coming out at the beginning of September. So they may not want to spend their entire nut on one movie, particularly one that they assume everybody is aware is coming out already. Shanae and Wendy, let me ask you guys, do you think Wonder Woman is going to hit its expectation from the tracking standpoint. And you also think that it's being overly marketed, undermarketed, or just right? Um, well, I feel like in terms of comparing to other movies, right, it, I, don't, I don't think it's being marketed as much. That's, but I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's, like, shocking. I'm, and I'm not wondering, like, why I haven't seen anything about Wonder Woman. I just haven't seen as much as I thought I was going to, especially now that we're so close to the release. At the same time, I think you're right because um, I believe that people are the most aware of this movie on DC Slate for the next couple months. And so they're 100% not needing to rely on toys and games and things like that because everyone's talking about Wonder Woman since last year already, since two years ago. So since we first got that first trailer, I haven't watched any trailers, haven't rewatched, I didn't watch the spot that they dropped during MTV because I don't want to know anything more about this movie because I'm already sold. Like, I'm going to see it. I'm stoked on it. Um, so I believe that most people are thinking like me. Like, that might be naive, but I think that most people are thinking like me, even after being let down by um, the DCEU in the past. I still believe that people are really hopeful about this movie. Um, and also, the tracking stuff is total BS. Like, most of our <laughs> viewers do a better job predicting opening weekend numbers <laughs> than, than these results. And I'm not even, like sucking up to you guys I, i'm always <laughs> impressed about how our viewers are like able to get within five million dollars of an opening number um, or opening box office than, than these results but i do kind of believe that most of them are going lower than what they truly think because i don't believe that they actually think it's going to open at 65. It, yeah i mean it could just be the power of positive thinking through lowered expectations exactly which might be the title of my biography yeah. wendy do you think that we're going to have it right on par with a 65 70 million dollar opening or do you think we're going to get something a little bit more substantial I certainly think it's going to go north of that. I see 65 and I think that's low and I feel like that's the studio or the tracking experts saying, okay, we're gonna put it at 65 because they're, they're looking at the, the, the backlash, if you will, of uh, BVS. And like, so, so there's always been this kind of DC Marvel thing and people are anticipating this movie to be bad. Or like, not me, I'm saying like, there's people in the chat that are like, oh, it's gonna be bad, she mm -hmm. can't act, blah, blah, blah. 
But from the first time I saw this trailer at Comic-Con last year, I was sold. When I saw her in BVS, I was sold, and she is my Wonder Woman. So I feel like they're balling it to play it safe, like you said, David. I think it's going to go to from, I think, 95 to maybe 105 mil mm -hmm. for opening weekend. And the marketing, um, they're not showing as much in the trailer. And, and I like that because I'm going to go back to v BVS again. When they showed me Doomsday at the end of it, I was like, this is going to be at the end of the movie. And then they're like, it's not going to be at the end of the movie. But then it was. Um, so I think they've learned from that. And so they're pulling back the reins just a little bit to keep us interested, but not to give away everything about the movie. So you go and you're satisfied. And they're giving a lot of visuals as far as like posters are everywhere for mm -hmm. Wonder Woman. It's all over New York. It was all over WonderCon. Um, Hot Topic, I know for a fact, is coming out with their own Wonder Woman collection from the Her Universe uh, collection mid-May. So I think they're going to get a huge push for marketing or like in about two weeks. Yeah, I mean, hopefully you see it, you know, pop into stores. Like, I'm, I'm, I, I would love to see every trailer, every commercial have Wonder Woman. Just go by Wendy's advice and don't give away too much of the actual film. I just hope that everybody who wants to get a Wonder Woman toy when they walk into a store is able to pick one up and they're not sold out and they have them on shelves. Some fun notes uh, provided to us by Cal, our Wonder Dog researcher, <laughs> is that the $65 million production, projection that Wonder Woman has for opening weekend is right in line with other first films from superhero movies like Captain America in 2011, the first Avenger, that was $65 million. Ant-Man was 57. Doctor Strange last year was $85 million. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see Wonder Woman do somewhere around there yeah. as a baseline and maybe even get up to the lofty $100 million magic number, Perry. Cool. That's kind of where I've been making my predictions for this, around Doctor Strange. But mm -hmm. also, I believe maybe a week or two ago, there was some sort of report released that said that uh, Warner Brothers had at this point before the Wonder Woman release compared to before the Suicide Squad release had spent, maybe it was even a little more on marketing than on Suicide Squad marketing at this point. But I mean, the thing to keep in mind with marketing and tracking and what we're seeing and what we're not seeing is maybe it's a good thing that we here in this room are not seeing a lot of Wonder Woman marketing because maybe they are looking at the tracking results and what demographics are already interested in their movie and they're they're trying to get other people out there. Yeah. It sounds like a sp smart approach to me. And basically, I think the moral of this story is one don't get crazy about what you are seeing in terms of marketing because we all live on the internet. We all know about this stuff. And don't get crazy in terms of tracking. These are tools in order to make a movie have a bigger release, which is probably what they did right with Beauty and the Beast and Jurassic World. That's why that movie, those movies made so much money because they take this data and they use it to their benefit. This is not a, project, a serious, like point blank prediction on what the movie is going to make opening weekend. Did you just tell the internet to not go crazy when they hear a news story? <laughs> David, I think that's going to happen. I think no, that's never. going down. I think, too, I mean, it's not a political show, but, you know, women in film, women in television, it's a hot-button topic right now, sure. right? It's hot, sure. you know? So I think everybody's paying so close attention. It's like, oh, is this because she's a female? It's a female-led movie? Like, I don't know. It's it Snatched under market? You know, Snatched is coming soon. We know. I don't know if that's under, if that's not being marketed enough. I don't know. I you saw, know, again, I've seen not... a trailer for Snatched every <laughs> single so, so day okay, for the see, past so month. Out. People know it's coming out. So I, I really think they're doing a good job with Wonder Woman. They don't want this to fail. A studio, they're not sitting in some office, a bunch of evil people mm -hmm. being like, man, I hope this movie fails. They spent way too much money because their jobs are on the line. Like they want this to succeed. So I don't think they're purposely out there trying to like make the movie fail or not market it enough. I really think they're behind Wonder Woman 100%. Yeah, well, hopefully their advertising budget can catch up to that of the Oscar winning film mm -hmm. Suicide Squad. All right, now it's time for <laughs> Buy or Sell. This is the part of the show where Sinead <laughs> is going to give us a topic, and then Perry, Dave, and I will use our real actual money to either buy <laughs> or sell the premise. Is that correct? Let's do it. All right. 20th Century Fox has revealed a new Alien Covenant clip featuring Damien Bashir's character's first encounter with the facehugger. Ridley Scott returns to the universe he created with this new chapter in the Alien franchise that stars Michael Fassbender, Catherine Waterston, Billy Crudup, Danny McBride, Damien Bashir, and James Franco. The marketing is now kicking into high gear as the movie readies its theatrical debut a week from today on May 19th. David, do you buy or sell the new clip from Alien Covenant? I came in a little bit light in my pocket this morning, so I don't know how much money Mark is uh, selling these uh, <laughs> items for. But twenty dollars uh, a story. Okay, I will buy that for twenty dollars. I am definitely on with Alien Covenant. I don't want to see anymore. Uh, I really don't want to see anymore. I just watched HBO did a first look. I think it was actually a couple of days ago. It just premiered first look uh, on on Alien Covenant. It looks gorgeous. I know a lot of you have already seen it, so I'm, I'm very jealous about that. I bought my tickets about three weeks ago. Uh, this is one of my favorite franchises. I'm a big Prometheus defender. 
Uh, I like that Ridley at least tried something different with Prometheus. I think he went a little too far away from Alien. It seems like now he's trying to bring that back for the fans, uh, which I'm happy to see. You know, have the aliens, have the face huggers. Damien Bashir, uh, again, I'm going to use my TV talk knowledge. If you ever watch a show called The Bridge, uh, it's an excellent show uh, on FX. He's a great actor. Uh, definitely uh, glad to see he's being featured here in this clip. Yeah, I, I am sold on this. I am seeing this. I already have my tickets. They don't need, I don't want to see any more ads. Yeah. I'm bought it. I already have my tickets. I'm, I'm sold. I'm going to use. $20 to buy this as well and also buy a ticket to Alien Covenant because like David, I have not seen it yet. Oh, We're good. the two losers in the office who have <laughs> not yet checked this movie out. I got invited to a screening at 9 a.m. today and I was like, sorry, the kids got to see what they should aim for one day as an adult. So I came here <laughs> and I did movie talk and I watched oh, this clip and look, I, I'm happy I saw the clip because it gives me even more confidence in a movie that I'm pretty high on mm -hmm. right now. I just wish I hadn't seen it because if you just read the description that Damien Bashir has a run with a face hugger, those tend not to end well for humans. Yeah. I don't know that humans have a winning record against face huggers. It's you're not breathing for a while after you find a face hugger on a ship. So, Perry, I know you've seen the movie. I, have. I know you're not going to ruin it for us here no. or for our viewers, but as a clip, did you buy or sell this? It's a good thing that I'm selling this clip because as we established on Jedi yesterday, I am completely broke from buying Star Wars stuff. So <laughs> I am happy to be selling this clip. And I'm also going to reiterate this as many times as I possibly can before that movie hits theaters next week. Stop watching everything. Stop watching these clips. Stop watching the trailers because this is one of the worst marketing campaigns I think I've ever seen Whoa. in my life in terms of spoiling a movie. Mm, that's terrible. There, there is absolutely mm. no doubt in my mind that you will appreciate Alien Covenant more if you do not watch trailers and clips. The only thing that I think will enhance your viewing experience, and I don't think this is a bad thing because I know when we first covered the prologues, I had a little bit of a negative spin. Those prologues will also make the movie better. Hmm. That, that you should watch. There's two of them. There's one where they're all having a little party before, and then the other one gives a little backstory on uh, Numi Rapace and Michael Fassbender's character between Prometheus and Alien Covenant. Those will help the viewing experience. Everything else will ruin it. Do not watch anything. All right, Griffin, mm -hmm. I get a slap on the wrist for uh. watching an Alien Covenant promo. You know, David, you may you mentioned that Prometheus maybe separated itself a little bit too far from the Alien universe. And when Ridley Scott was first talking about making a follow-up to Prometheus, we're like, great. Do we get to see Xenomorphs? Do we get to see the mouth and the other mouth come out? Mm -hmm. And Ridley Scott was like, I don't know. Then we started to see these trailers. We're like, oh, clearly. So maybe they overcompensated by throwing that the face huggers and the Xenomorphs at us just to remind us once again, this clearly is going to be a movie taking place in the alien world. I am over the moon for this. Let's go see that movie yes. next weekend. <laughs> All right. What's up next? Let's talk Fizz Facility. Okay, Bloom and the Fizz Facility Pictures announced Thursday that the long-delayed sequel to The Strangers 2 has finally found its cast, adding Mad Men's Christina Hendricks to star alongside Bailey Madison and Lewis Pullman. The announcement comes nine years after the original The Strangers hit theaters back in 2008, picking up where Liv Tyler and Scott Speedman's original left off. The story will see Hendricks and her family terrorized by three masked figures at an abandoned trailer park during a cross-country road trip gone wrong. 47 Meters Down director Johannes Roberts will direct based on a script by original Strangers director and writer Brian Bertino and Ben Katai. Principal photography begins on May 30th here in LA with the release date yet to be determined. Mark, do you buy or sell the casting for The Strangers 2? I buy it because as soon as I heard that it was the 47 meters director, I just imagined sharks but with the bags over their head like trying <laughs> to disguise themselves. Uh, I've been up for Strangers 2 for a long time. The first one freaked me out as I think most people did. Even if you've never seen the movie The Strangers, you definitely saw the trailer when just the dude leans his head out and then leans back in and you're like oh my god that's the scariest thing i've ever seen in my life they were trying to get this sequel off the ground forever so i'm excited to see christina hendrix in this i'm more excited just to hear like with new mutants that we have a good cast but we also have a production schedule and that this movie is being made perry we're finally mm -hmm. getting a follow-up to the strangers nine years later is it too late is no. it not late enough, or is it perfect? That's the brilliant thing about this concept. I don't think it's one of those things that can be too far removed from the first movie, especially when you're giving a brand new cast. And Christina Hendricks, I'm, there's really no better female lead to cast in this. And I'm actually excited to see uh, Bailey Madison, too, just because I remember mm -hmm. way back in the day, I covered the press junket for one of her first movies. It was that Don't Be Afraid of the Dark remake. And... Yeah, she. Uh, that movie is not the greatest. I had some fun with it, but she was like a delightful little kid. So it's kind of fun to see her all grown up and in another movie. And one that I'm really excited about. Only thing that has me nervous about Strangers 2 is 
the premise because the premise of the first one is that they, they go to the house and it's seemingly random. It's that line, you know, why are you doing this to us? Because you were home. The idea mm. of them being in a trailer and, oh, the lights go, the power goes out. I just hope it's not a situation where they're, they're targeted or this is like the bad guy's playground or something. I want them to randomly go there for them to randomly have that encounter with the three of them and it to have a very similar feel as the first one. Yeah, I mean, I went on a lot of road trips as an Air Force brat, and the most fun killings were the random ones. Now, David, <laughs> let's go to you on this, because I really enjoy Christina Hendricks uh, on uh, uh, Almost Period on, on Comedy Central, so mm -hmm. I, I never I never caught Mad Men, mm -hmm. but I hear she's great in that. Does this casting news give you more confidence in The Strangers, too? Yeah, I, I buy it just because of Christina Hendricks, because I, I was a huge Mad Men fan. I mean, as soon as she, when you watch Mad Men season one, and she walks on screen for the first time, you know, you, you've, I've never, I never saw her before that. So I was like, who is this woman? You know, it's red hair, the hips, the curves. I mean, everything. You know, she's just, she's just Get gorgeous. in there, Griff. It's beautiful. Sorry, I'm being too descriptive. I know it's, it's early. Uh, just beautiful woman. I'm excited she's it's, getting more work. But folks, a bit of advice. If you come across an abandoned trailer park, even if you're just curious, like, hmm, I've never been in a trailer park before. Don't go in there. Just leave it alone. You just drive past. You see some dark, spooky road. Just keep going. Just stay in the light. It's just people, people just don't learn. They don't learn from watching horror movies. Oh, so. David, I've never been to a trailer park. Let's go check it out. <laughs> yeah, so just stay away. Um, I remember we were driving. I was with my family one time. My mom, we were in Detroit. We were driving by 8 Mile, you know, and she knows Eminem's like, oh, Eminem, 8 Mile in Detroit. That's where Eminem's from. Let's go drive in there and check it out. And I'm sure there's some very nice places in 8 Mile, but I don't know that community. It's like, no, mom, we should not drive randomly through 8 Mile. Just stay away from places you don't know. Last time I was uh, working in Detroit at the uh, the, the comedy Detroit castle. Detroit are lovely people, by the way. I I, uh, yeah, no, I like Detroit. Detroit. I, went, I went club hopping on 8 Mile. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I survived. It's another period. It's not almost period. I was drunk when I watched it. Uh, Sinead, <laughs> do you want to see The Strangers too? Does that thing look scary? Did the first one freak you out? Um, I... I can't watch any scary movies by myself, so mm. I, I can't, I'll watch it if I have friends or loved ones and the lights are on and it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. But other than that, you will not see me watching this movie. I can't watch scary things by myself. I am a child. It will ruin my life. I won't be able to sleep. I'll wake Harrison up to keep me company. Like, it's not a good look on me. So, uh, Wendy, are you up for some 11 a.m. scares with Sinead? I am up for some 11 a.m. scares for Sinead, with, with Sinead. The first time I saw this movie, um, I, I dragged a friend from work with me to see it, and he parked in one area of the parking lot, and I happened to park in, like, the most far away, <laughs> dark corner you can ever imagine. And after seeing this, and I was like, hey, so, like, do you want to take a walk? He's like, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. I was like, didn't get the hint. So I, like, <laughs> speed walked to my car, and this movie freaked me out so much that I, I feel like I should be excited for the second one. But reading the premise, it just... It's there's something that's not there. It just seems kind of like, OK, we're just going to throw them in a scary hills of eyes kind of scenario and just have these same three villains from the first movie reappear in the second one. It's just going to be a slasher film. And that's not what the first one was about. So I am going to sell it for right now. I buy, I buy the cast, but I sell it. That's a, that's a totally fair point. I mean, look, you could take a premise like this. You just throw a bunch of burlap sacks on people and say, oh, we'll get some jump scares eventually. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, The Strangers 2 is going to do for cross-country road trips what Hostel did for going overseas. Mm -hmm. We'll have to wait and find out. What's our next story, Sinead? Paramount has released one final Red Band trailer for its big screen reboot of Baywatch. D Dwayne, Dane, Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Zac Efron lead the cast of the new movie based on the original show that ran between 1989 and 2001 that starred David Hasselhoff and Pamela Pamela Anderson. The trailer showcases some of the new action and fight scenes that will be at the center of the movie, along with the crude humor that makes it a, a solid R-rated flick. Baywitch, Baywatch, I can't talk right now. Baywitch. Baywatch. Baywitch. <laughs> Baywatch also stars Priyanka Chopra, <laughs> Alexandra Daddario, Kelly Rohrbach, John Bass, Hannibal Buress, and Rob Hubel, and is directed by Seth Gordon, and it opens on May 26th. Perry, do you buy or sell this red band trailer for Baywitch? <laughs> and I buy Baywitch, but sell this trailer. I've had enough of Baywatch. I think I've kind of reached that point where I keep watching the trailers and I have so much faith in The Rock that every single time I watch something and I'm like, it, it, it looks okay, but I'm not really laughing out loud. I think my patience has expired with that. It's not, I'm not like offended by this trailer. It's not anything God awful, but I think I've kind of hit the point where I, I'm really not laughing, so I'm losing a lot of faith. So I, I'm going to sell this, and even though I'm curious to see the movie, I'm I'm not hopeful. I am with you. Huge buy for Bay Witch. Uh, huge sell <laughs> for this trailer because it's starting to get to that point where 
I don't like when comedy movies have trailers that feel desperate. And this is, I like the tone that they're going for with Baywatch. I think it's really the only tone you can aim for where you're clearly spoofing yourself. You're trying to have a real story. The characters within the film are taking it seriously so that the rest of us can watch it like it's the naked gun or airplane. I just feel like it's dripping with please like me. And I'm not a fan of when comedy movies do that. I like when a comedy film has the confidence to show us a couple funny things in the trailer, but save the bulk of the goodies for the movie. I don't feel like they did that with this. This trailer was the first indication, David, that I'm really starting to sweat if I'm a fan of Baywatch right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm already sweating right now, and uh, it's because it's hot in here. And <laughs> no, uh, I, I'm going to sell this, but I, I want to see it. I'm excited to see it, but I think there's such there's too much of a good thing. I think we're seeing too much of Baywatch right now. I talked about the marketing for Wonder Woman. I want to see more Wonder Woman. I think I want to see less Baywatch, yeah. even though I'm interested in seeing both films right now. Uh, think of The Hangover. Remember The Hangover came out. Kind of came in quiet. Went to go see it. Weren't really don't know what to expect. I think a lot of us were blown away by it. like, wow, this is actually a really clever, you know, well written comedy. I feel like with Baywatch, like I said, it's just being like it's in your face. Like, go see me, go see me. But I'm hoping this is going to be like a 21 Jump Street, where it's or or like a Hangover, the first Hangover film, where it's going to be a pleasant surprise. We're all going to have laughs. No one's taking themselves seriously. But I think I agree with you guys. It's just it's been too much for me over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, you talk about not seeing a mm -hmm. lot of ads for Snatched right now. It's not mm -hmm. a great comedy, but I laughed a lot. One of the reasons why I laughed is because I didn't see any of that stuff in the trailers, mm -hmm. which underwhelm me. Baywatch, we like you. We'll go see the movie. <laughs> Stop showing us all this stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, what's our next and last buy or sell topic? Deadline is reporting 12 Years a Slave Helmer Steve McQueen will direct a full-length feature documentary on the life of iconic hip-hop star Tupac Shakur. McQueen, who won the Oscar for the Best Picture winner 12 Years a Slave, will direct, and Jason Jackson will produce with Nigel Sinclair, the man behind a number of music documentaries, including the most recent The Beatles' Eight Days a Week at the Touring Years. No word yet on a start of production or release. David, do you buy or sell a Tupac documentary directed by Steve McQueen? Yeah, I mean, Steve McQueen's just one, he's one of the best directors out there. He doesn't do a lot, you know, because, I mean, he's very careful with the projects that he chooses. I mean, 12 Years a Slave was great. You want to see a good film? It's hard to watch. Watch Shame with Michael Fassbender. That's one of Michael Fassbender's best performances. It's, it is a tough watch, a guy battling sexual addiction, but it's very interesting. Then 12 Years a Slave, of course, which you would tell Edgy for, another brilliant film, tough to watch. Not something I want to watch multiple times. Like, man, I can't wait for the Blu-ray for this to come out so I can watch <laughs> it again. Uh, but he does such good work. I'd love to see him do a documentary. Uh, uh, especially on Tupac's tour, we have All Eyes on Me uh, coming out pretty soon. That looks great. So I think, I don't know if Tupac's hot right now. You know, uh, hopefully he never dies out because he was such a good storyteller. He was a poet. There's this book that I think is like 200 pages worth of poems that you can buy. It's definitely worth reading. He was one of the best rappers that was a storyteller. All rappers are in a sense some kind of a storyteller, but he was one of the best at it. His stories were always intriguing, painful, but they felt honest. It wasn't like Tupac was trying to put on a show. You know, he was a... He, he died way before his time, sadly, of course. I remember when I was in seventh grade, I walked into the school, and my friend's like, yo, Dave, they killed Tupac. I was like, what? You know, it just shocked me. You know, I was in seventh grade, but it just shocked me that he had died, and uh, I, I, I'm definitely buying this. I'm going to see. I'll spend, I mean, you know, I'm going to take my $20 from Alien. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put it towards the, the Tupac Shakur documentary. <laughs> <laughs> I will buy it as well. And Tupac, it's, it seems that a lot of celebrities, once they, once they meet a particularly an untimely demise, 20 years down the road is when we really want to explore all these things and unravel the mystery. You see it with Kurt Cobain, and you're certainly going to see it with Tupac Shakur, and I think it's warranted, because I'd like to see all eyes on me. I like those trailers with this as, as soon as I read it I was like I'd love to see Steve McQueen do something original but then I stepped back and I was like well what were some of my favorite pieces of entertainment last year and there were documentaries whether mm -hmm. it's going way back in time with the 13th with David Duvernay's movie or you talk about something like Wiener or what happened Miss Simone so there's a lot of flicks out there that are very entertaining and dramatic but also can tell you a true story in a documentary fashion so Steve McQueen doing this Perry my only question how is he going to get his boy Michael Fassbender into uh, this movie no, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not happening and <laughs> as much as I like Fassbender that's probably a good thing here right. But, I mean, you bring up a lot of good points just in terms of how, you know, it, it's nice to get something that, that is so accurate and true. And as excited as I am for All Eyes on Me, I think a good pairing for that is an actual documentary. Mm -hmm. And there, there were so many quotes in, uh, I don't know if it came from an official press release or if Deadline was the first to report it, but, you know, just quotes talking about how, you know, McQueen's going to be working really closely with the family. And, you know, we're not in the business of defending Tupac. Our job is to allow him to be seen in the most complete way so his actions, his choices, and his words will allow him to speak for himself. That's 
right mm-hmm. there is the movie that I want to see. So I'm happy we have all, all Eyes on Me. I'm happy this goes along with it. And there definitely is a big push for more Tupac now because just this morning I think it was announced that USA uh, greenlit a Tupac wow. TV series. So get ready for a lot of it in the next few years. Also, too, Mark, this is another good example of this. Remember OJ last year? We mm-hmm. had the FX right. show, yeah. People versus OJ. You know, just killed it with the Emmys. And then all of a sudden there's this great, I think, four-part you know, eight-hour documentary that comes out, you know, on, uh, I think it was on ESPN is where it premiered, and that was excellent, too. So, I mean, OJ was hot last year. I mean, this is going to be the year for Tupac. Ah, should have been mine. Nice mm-hmm. point there. Sorry. <laughs> that was by or so. We want to remind you guys that at the end of this show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. Go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. And this is not the only show that we have on the Collider Video YouTube channel. There's a plethora of content, including yesterday's Jedi Council. I was back for the first time in three weeks. Did you notice? Thank you. Also, check out every Friday. That's today. Jeremy Johns' show, Awesome Tacky, drops on the Verizon Go 90 app. It's super easy and free to download. Just go to your phone, download the Verizon Go 90 app, and check out all the fun with Awesome Tacky. This weekend, we have Collider Mailbag both Saturday and Sunday, as well as the behind the scenes mm-hmm. and bloopers. Perry, what can we look forward to this weekend? Oh, we have round two of Beer Pong. And as much as I want to have Ellis back on the table yeah, there. Yeah, me too. A lot of fans <laughs> do too. You lost your first round, so we had to play a new team this time. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully, the series will continue, and you'll have your next chance. Team March for Death did not play <laughs> up to par. Is Riley in the room? Okay, I played pretty well. Um, we also <laughs> have the movie trivia schmodown dropping later on today. It is the inner geekdom battle between Robert Meyer Burnett and Jeremy Johns. This is a number one contender match, so the winner of today's game gets to play against Hector Navarro in the Collider Collision, which is going to air in July. So will it be Robert Meyer Burnett getting back? to prominence or will it be jeremy johns representing once again his return of the jedi bed sheets as a cape here's a quick clip I literally cannot wait for that matchup. And special thanks to Adam Smith for helping out with that. And no thanks whatsoever to Cody Hall for <laughs> sitting there falling asleep. We now move on to mailbag. Anytime you guys can write us, collidervideo at gmail.com. Sometimes we'll answer your mail on this here program or on our weekend show, Collider Mailbag. Sinead, what's up today? Is it ninjas or transformers? Well, ninja transformers, right? Oh, my God. Edgar Wright is one of the more popular directors in geek culture. However, when it comes to mainstream... His name isn't as famous as directors like Spielberg, Tarantino, and Nolan, and his films haven't done huge numbers. His his domestic high being 31,524,275, worldwide high being 80,573,774. Will Baby Driver be the film to make him more mainstream and give him the opportunity to direct bigger films? You know, a lot of hosts would have just skipped over those number totals. Sinead, write it down to the dollar. That's why you're the best in the business. Uh, Perry, you love numbers. I do like numbers. Edgar Wright, his name is on the tip of a lot of people's tongues for a lot of projects. When you hear about something is being made or something got greenlit, oh, can we get Edgar Wright to do that? Now, certainly, that box office total would have been a lot higher if he had stuck with Ant-Man or if Marvel had stuck with his interpretation of Ant-Man. But he's made a lot of great movies, particularly in the realm of comedy. Why haven't they hit more so in terms of box office numbers? Edgar Wright is in kind of a cool position where even though he has not made one of those movies that has crushed it at the box office, he still, or at least he gives me the impression, that he still has opportunities at his fingertips. Mm -hmm. He's just choosing to make his stuff. And even though I don't think Baby Driver is going to be that movie that comes out Mm -hmm. and winds up crushing it and turning into a a big moneymaker that has everybody coming, knocking on his door for all their big studio projects, I think it's still going to do pretty well. It's just on Edgar Wright money-making levels, which probably isn't what everybody wants to hear, but I think my prediction for that opening weekend is something like $15 million, which is a solid start for him, just because I wish I had the, the other numbers here. Oh, no, I do. Oh. Um, I you really have nothing but numbers that. on your computer. 
at all times. Because I was just looking back. And World's End opened with 8 million domestically. Scott Pilgrim mm. opened 10. So I, Hot Fuzz made, a, and Hot Fuzz overall made a 23 in the States, which I think is his biggest uh, overall domestic total in the States. And that, that still is not that much money. So I think that Baby Driver is going to put him in a good position. It's not going to change the game at all. And I really wish I had an answer as to why. Perhaps, you know, Baby Driver could have long legs if word of mouth is good, because I know it crushed it with reviews at South by. So hopefully that's what happens. Yeah, but it's also nice to have a director with a name like that who may not have a huge fan base, but there's also a reliable number of people that will go see anything Edgar Wright does. David, mm -hmm. do you think Baby Driver is going to turn the tide as far as getting the rest of the world in on the greatness that is Edgar Wright, or do you think it's going to continue to be that smaller under the radar kind of feature? I think it's going to be continue to be that smaller under the radar kind of feature, but I think it's still going to do well. I mean, their, their advertising will be so far. It's not going to until June 28th. It's a long ways out, and we're already seeing trailers that's like 100% on Rotten Tomatoes because, like Perry said, it premiered uh, South by Southwest, or critics are really behind it. I think it's going to do well, but not that's going to you know, make him into this big blockbuster kind of guy. But maybe he just hasn't had the right vehicle yet. I love Scott Pilgrim vs. World. I love mm -hmm. the, the, the the series. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. A six-book series that they condense into one movie. That's not an easy thing to do, and he did a great job of that. He actually got his start in doing TV. He was a TV writer for a while, so maybe I think it would be a cool vehicle for him, not just because I'm on TV talk, but I'd love to see him do <laughs> more television because he's such a good writer. Your gravitas is how many times you name drop TV you talk. You got to do it. You got to promote episode. it. I got to sell it. I got to sell it. So no, you're going to be um, tweeting Edgar Wright later on today. Hey, if you want to make a TV series, I'm happy to talk <laughs> yeah, about I'm it. I'm happy to talk about it. No. Do you think Baby Driver does well opening weekend? What's your, what, what's your number? I would stick with, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to go up to 15 million. A little higher. Though. Scott oh, yeah. Pilgrim is about 10 million. Yeah, I'm gonna Scott, go, I'm gonna go 15 million. It has 15 its competition million. because not yeah. only that week, and I think Despicable Me is also opening wide, but you have The House mm -hmm. with Will Ferrell and Amy yeah. Poehler. That's a comedy. It might not be as good as Baby Driver, but it's going to have wide appeal because you have two huge stars in that movie. So it's going to eat some box office out of that. So I would look for Baby Driver. Maybe it's one of those weekends where everything does well. So I'm going to go north of you guys. I'm going to pull Sinead, wow. and I'm going to say it's going to make $17 million, $693,211 <laughs> wow. opening weekend. That sound good? to you? Yes. Also, too, don't forget the previous week, uh, Transformers comes out. Now, oh, I know God. those have big drop-offs, but I don't know if that's going to suck up any of the box office, too. It'll be the second week Transformers is out. It certainly will suck. Let's, Let's go on to Mailbag. <laughs> Wendy Lee has been checking out uh, the tweets, actually. We're moving away from Mailbag. Let's go on to Twitter. What do we got first in the, the Twitter sphere? The first one comes from James Thomas Welsh, who writes, What do you think about Cannes Film Festival banning Netflix and non-theatrically released movies from the festival? Uh, you can hear that story and think, oh boy, they're just turning their noses up in the air at anything that is not theatrical release. But I think that they're trying to maintain some sense of purity in the world of what a film festival is, that these are just movies, but it doesn't really seem to me to be a good harbinger of the times when you have so much great content that are original features coming out on Netflix that are not allowed to be submitted for Cannes. I don't think it's going to hurt the Netflix movies that are coming out, but it is kind of a head-scratcher to see a film festival as prominent as Cannes saying, only movies. They're theatrically released and not embracing the new technology that we have. Yeah, I mean, what makes a film? Is the question, you know? I mean, Scorsese, hundred million dollar project with Robert De Niro that we're going to see, you know, and uh, um, Al Pacino is going to be on Netflix. You're going to go home on a Friday night, just like tonight. Maybe you'll go home and watch The Master of None with Aziz Ansari. You'd be like, I'm going to watch the next Scorsese film. It's still a film. It's still a movie. Just because it doesn't come out in the theater doesn't not make it a movie. I don't understand that they're pushing against a tidal wave. You know, the world is changing. People are sitting there with their cell phones on the train watching the new season of Bosch, watching, you know, uh, an old classic film, you know, on, on their phone. That's what's happening. People aren't going to theaters as much. People still do, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it's still a movie. That really bothers me that we're not going to see some. What if it's like one of the best movies of the year that comes out on Netflix and they ignore it? That just, well, I don't know, it just kind of bothers me. That happens in any changing <laughs> industry. It's like some, some people are, are with it and they're going to start you know, embracing things like Netflix and mm -hmm. some will come a little later and have, uh, you know, have that time where they have to get used to a new trend that's going to happen. And there's no doubt in my mind that all festivals, no matter how prestigious, no matter where in the world they're taking mm -hmm. place, are going to have to embrace Netflix. Because like we've discussed this week with The Irishman, 
Netflix is going to have a very, very good shot of delivering Oscar-worthy movies in the very near future. And I have a feeling that I was trying to very briefly brush up on this story. It seems, it seems like this decision also has something to do with uh, net, obviously showing Netflix movies theatrically, which I do. I can understand that argument. And something about it showing in French cinemas. I'm, you know, you can just Google it and read the article. I don't want to paraphrase and give the wrong information right now. But, you know, it sounds like they're making a reasonable case, but it also sounds like their case is something that's going to need to be adjusted in the very near future. Yeah, it'd be nice to at least see like a sponsor's exemption or something like that. Like if, you, if you're trying to get into a golf tournament, but you have the sponsor's exemption, you can get in even if you don't go through the normal qualifying measures. I think maybe they just aren't up to what Netflix is doing with something like Beasts of No Nation. What's going to be the movie that wakes them up? Is it going to be War Machine? Is it going to be The Irishman? Maybe they just watch The Ridiculous Six and are like, we're never letting anything from Netflix <laughs> ever in our film festival. We'll have to wait and see when that changes. It's not going to be this year. It probably Probably will be down the line. All right, what's up next, Wendy? The next one comes from Chris Woodburn, who writes, What's everyone's favorite trailer so far this year? Mine is War for the Planet of the Apes. That's a good one, Mr. Woodburn. I would say my favorite trailer of the year right now is I've liked a lot of the marketing content for I've liked a lot of the DC content, which is which is good. I, I like the Justice League stuff I saw during March Madness. I like the Wonder Woman recent promo material, but no trailer made me smile, made me more excited. I giggled audibly when I saw Thor recognize mm -hmm. Hulk in the Thor Ragnarok trailer. I had a ball watching that thing. Thor Ragnarok. I can't, I can't make it my top one because The Last Jedi. But Luke is so damn grumpy in that it's like, like it's, it's not the chewy we're home because you're not like, like leaving the theater like, yeah, we're back. The whole gang's back. We're like, what the hell happened to Luke? Mm -hmm. So as far as a fun trailer, I'm going Thor Ragnarok. But The Last Jedi, that's the movie I'm most excited to see. And the trailer didn't let me down. What do you oh, got, no. Barry? I definitely would put Last Jedi in there, but also the Thor Ragnarok trailer and the Guardians of the Galaxy trailer. I think we got the one this year where it's, uh, it's the bit with the bits with Baby Groot that also ends with uh, Mantis, you know, touching Drax and that whole yeah, bit. Yeah. I really like that trailer. Oh, now I got my Marvel money so I could afford some buy or sells next week. <laughs> um, other than those two, just to throw in something different, I think one of my favorite teaser trailers of this year so far is the one for It Comes at Night. And not just because I wound up seeing and loving that movie, but what a smart way to Ooh. advertise a movie like that. You know, that just that slow shot of that creepy red door, hearing what they're talking about, yet not quite knowing what they're talking about, and then that quick string of visuals after, that left an impression. How about you, David? What do you got? I, mean, I can't believe I'm saying this, but man, Transformers last night. Oh. I, I know, I know, I know, Sorry. I know, I know it's Transformers. Cody, John don't Rocco, leave. Cody, come back. come back. Cody come is, back. Cody's out. I, I lost, I lost. Building. Half the suit is left. Um, no, no more new camera angles. Oh, it's still working. Um, no, uh, Michael Bay, I, I haven't liked the Transformers movie since the first one, but that guy, they know how to cut trailers, and I really enjoy watching Transformers trailers. Am I looking forward to seeing the movie? No. If it was a buy or sell, I'd sell it. But I enjoy the trailer. Talking about just trailers, I think they do. A, Michael Bay's films do a great job for doing their trailers. They don't reveal too much. They're exciting. The uh, action sequences look spectacular, like you would expect from a big summer blockbuster. But then when you go see it, I feel like I'm always underwhelmed. But I love the trailers. And though. and I made the joke earlier. I root for Transformers. I want to see a good yeah. Transformers movie. I really do. I would love for King Arthur to stab Hitler in the heart and high five Optimus Prime after he does it. But these <laughs> trailers, this slate of Transformers trailers, I think has been the weakest in the oh, franchise yeah. thus far. Because yeah. usually I get excited to see a Transformers movie. This one, I'm just like, I, maybe maybe they've cried dude, wolf too many times with dude, me. Dude, give Anthony Hopkins a shot, dude. I like Come Anthony on, dude. Hopkins saying. <laughs> Dude. So I think number three for me would be Thor Ragnarok. Number two is The Last Jedi. Number one is, of course, 47 meters. God, I love sharks. All right, Wendy, what, what's up next? All right, this next one comes from Logan Morrow, who writes, After Exodus, Gods and Kings, it feels like Christian Bale has started to fade away. Do you think he's losing his star appeal? Uh, he certainly wasn't when we had the pleasure of bumping into each other in the red carpet at Rogue One. Yes, yeah, sometimes they let me dress up and go to nice events. I saw Christian Bale there. That is just one impressive hunk of man but christian bale he ain't going anywhere he may not be in at the forefront on marquis because he's not batman anymore but he certainly has a lot of projects coming up that perry's going to tell us about right now i'm looking right now i mean the the top one is uh the jungle book mm -hmm. where the he, other jungle book the, the other, andy circus the jungle book the mm -hmm. other is that the other jungle book yes it is i forgot that that ever went into 
post production? Did that go into post production? Yeah, man. They they, they, they got here. a lot of stuff in the can. They delayed it by a year, but yeah. maybe that's for spacing for them from the first Jungle Book. But they also have done a lot of photography for it already. So he has that on the list. He also has something called Hostels, and then that untitled uh, Dick Cheney pro project where he plays Dick Cheney. So that could be a big deal for him. And going away, I mean, he just had the big short pretty recently. So I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. I think you got to realize, like, when you get to a certain level as an actor like Christian Bale, those guys, I'll give an example. Think about Daniel Radcliffe for Harry Potter. It's like, where's Daniel Radcliffe been? I mean, you've seen him, but it's always been in smaller, smaller films because when you, he made like $50 million for the last two movies. He can take a little vacation. He can take a break. He can pick and choose. He can do some Broadway. <laughs> he can do some, you know, do some theater. He can pick and choose what he wants to do. Christian Bale is at that level. Probably made so much money off those three films. Same with Keanu Reeves. Made like over $100 million on the three Matrix movies. He can take a break, chill, do his passion projects. He doesn't need another big blockbuster. You're at that, like, very few actors do that. Like, the guys like Denzel, who does a $20 million film a year, Brad Pitt, those guys, Tom Cruise, they're few and far between. There's very few actors at that level that get paid that much money every year. Most of the guys, you know, just kind of do some pet project with like a big blockbuster every now and then. So, yeah, Christian Bale is going to be here to stay. Yeah, that Harry Potter actor. money doesn't stop rolling in. For no, me. no. He's, Daniel Radcliffe can set. afford to go lay on a beach and fart. He actually did that <laughs> in a movie. Army Man, yeah. <laughs> should check it out. So. Yeah. <laughs> really good movie. Yeah. All right, Wendy, let's do two more. All right, this one comes from Mr. Yasman300, who writes, What movie do you think was disrespectful for the fan base, even if it wasn't their intention? My, my pick is Gem and the Hologram. Independence Day Resurgence. Oh. That is the most <laughs> disrespectful movie for Independence Day fans I have ever seen in my life. It is god all It's a bad movie, period. Yeah. But And you guys have all heard me say this, so I'm going to say it again just because I want to. It was a bad mm. movie, period, and it was also a bad movie because it did crappy things to the mythology and the characters where now I can't watch Independence Day, the original one, without thinking of what happened in that movie. Yeah, Independence Day resurgence takes some therapy to get through. Um, Batman and Robin is one that just <laughs> completely, I mean, you take a great character and you do that to it. But there's, there's smaller movies that I think got more hurt by their interpretations because they don't have the clout of a Batman, or even an Independence Day, which people can still watch that movie and celebrate. Something like like Jonah Hex. Like, like mm. there, there's hardcore fans of that. Or even Ghost Rider or Spawn. Those are those are properties that fans care about. That they they put that they invested their time, their money into loving those comic books. And you finally get this character on the big screen, and that happens. Can you think of any other examples, David, where it just it's just such a deflating bummer to see the way it went cinematically? For me, it was it was Assassin's Creed, and I, I wanted to go see that. I ignored the critics, and I know we're critics, but I ignored everybody. I heard it's just such a bad movie. I wanted to take it in as a fan. I played every single of all the major Assassin's Creed games. I played all of the major ones out there. You know, Black Flag, Assassin's Creed Three, Assassin's Creed Two, One, and I went to see it. It, had, it felt nothing like the video game. The video game was this beautiful right. journey where you get transported to places like you know, uh, you know, uh, Paris and Jerusalem, and you see all these lush, gorgeous places that you visit. And the game, and the movie was just dark, and there was no personality, and it was just bland and boring. I'm like, what am I watching? This is not the video game that I've come to love over the years. It's somebody's interpretation of that, which always bothers me. I feel like people don't capture you know what the game was about and that really i don't know it's just it really disappointed me now i'm just it. wondering who is hurt more perry by independence day resurgence <laughs> i was or David hurt by, by assassin's creed you guys really, have been affected yeah. yeah i wanted that to be good it wasn't all right well i think we can all agree super mario brothers is more detrimental to its oh, family yeah. than i forgot about that Dustin <laughs> sorry. Hoffman. i'm sorry oh, i brought gosh. that up i know I it's friday and we're trying to have a good time my <laughs> bad yeah. all right wendy let's try to end this friday on a positive note what's our last tweet of the day uh, just a thought, The Last Airbender is equally as awful. Oh, good one. Yeah, good one. That's, That's a good the one. positive note we wanted. One. That's, all right, <laughs> wrapping it up. All right, last one comes from <laughs> Sam Waldron, who writes, what trilogy will be more memorable in 100 years, Lord of the Rings or the original Star Wars? <laughs> oh, thanks for playing, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I'm so happy all you <laughs> hobbits and orcs and wizards showed up to the game. Thank you for making the long trip to come play in this contest. We have some lovely parting gifts for you. We have Trilogy, the home game. We just don't have a championship belt because that is going to be the still greatest trilogy of all time, the Star Wars classic trilogy. I don't care if it's the original one or the special editions. It's the greatest trilogy mankind has ever or will ever produce. You hear me, apes? I thought that was going to be a more difficult question. Thanks for making it easy, because I was going to stress about it. Freaking Star Wars. Well, no, but I, if you throw made, apes made, in there... He's because, making because, me nervous right now. Uh-oh, David. 
Huh? Look at that. Yeah. I, I will open uh, this I didn't up. hear the question. Uh, we're done, right? Thanks for joining us. Oh, my God. David's a huge Lord of the Rings no, fan. No, but that like, would be, a, that, I think that's like a great, like, I know we don't have time, but that's that would be a Scotland great discussion too. to have. Like, but we like got all Star the time Wars in the world. I'm running Lord the ship Rings. today. No, Star Wars <laughs> is incredible. I mean, you know, I mean, you guys saw us at Star Wars Celebration. Like, you know, I'm reading Thrawn. I love the books and love seeing the movies. But with Lord of the Rings... How was I, Lord of the Rings celebration this year? I, but like one, two, and... Th I don't know. That's tough. That's a hard. That's a good question. Yeah. I, Star Wars. We're going with Star Wars. Star Wars wins the day. No, oh, yeah. I, let, let me ask you guys. Yeah, if if you Wars. open up to other trilogies, do you yeah. think there's any other trilogy that can compete? Because if War for the Planet of the Apes, what Ooh. I was alluding to earlier, if that closes that trilogy, as well as those first two movies, you could have another... I don't think it's going to contend with Star Wars, but mm. you could have another one that is of note. I think it's right up there. Another trilogy that I consider a trilogy is Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, the Crystal Skulls had a kingdom and it was cute. We have those first three <laughs> right. and I consider that a nice trilogy as well. There's a lot of great trilogies and I think if War for the Planet of the Apes winds up being that good, that could be a super memorable trilogy. Mm -hmm. Star Wars is on another level. Star Wars changed everything behind the camera, in front of the camera, creating those characters, creating like this mass hysteria over toys. The way that that has infiltrated just society, pop culture, daily life is completely different than any other series out there. I don't think there's any topping that. It's true. I mean, I think some other quality series, like, I, I love the Die Hard trilogy. You know, I know 2 isn't maybe everybody's favorite at the uh, airport. I love, I love yeah. 2. I love 2. I know Die Hard, it's not, it's not Star Wars. It's not as good as Star Wars, but I love Die Hard. Die Hard trilogy for me. I might take the Die Hard trilogy over Lord of the Rings. Ooh. Don't hurt me. Let's get out of here. All right. Thank you guys <laughs> for joining us on Collider Movie Talk. The special Friday, Mark Ellis gets dressed up for his job interview at Men's Warehouse Edition. Thank you, everybody, both behind the camera. Adam Smith for staying away. Cody Hall for taking a nap. And over there on the host desk, first of all, we have Sinead DeFries. Where can the kids find you? I'm online at that so Sinead, I mean, that's not what it is, at Sinead DeFries <laughs> and at that so Sinead.com. And I'll be back on Monday um, on TV Talk with Mr. David Griffin. That's so Sinead. Wendy Lee, <laughs> where can the kids find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Up here at the main table with me, thank you for joining us, Grand Moff Nemiroff. Perry, where can everybody check you out? I've earned that name today. I am on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. And a reminder, Collider Behind the Scenes tomorrow, 2 p.m., Beer Pong. Be there. David Griffin hyphen Baggins. Where can the kids check you out, buddy? Uh, when I'm not at Men's Warehouse with Mark trying on these <laughs> spiffy new blazers, uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at GriffinDE, as well as with DDD DJ DeFries on Collider TV Talk. I am merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much for watching today's edition. Reminder to comment on YouTube. Click that like button because we showed up and tried really hard. You guys can catch me at the Comedy Store tonight for upcoming stand up dates. Just go to MarkEllisLive.com on Twitter, MarkEllisLive. We'll see you guys next Monday. I guess it's this Monday for a new edition of Collider Movie Talk. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.